So for this session, we have Dr. Hannah Burek from MSU. She's the professor and chairperson of the Department of Entomology. She has experience with training and collaborative research in Peru and Brazil. And her areas of expertise are integrated pest management, invasive species biology and management, and specialty crop management. And um, we have Dr. David Hughes, who you just um, met. So, um, and then myself, um, I'm here just to sort of provide backup support. So I, with that, I believe Hannah is going to take the floor. Sure. Uh, so thank you all for having me here this morning um, or whatever time you happen to be at joining us. Um, and I'll just let you go ahead from slide to slide, uh, Callista, so we can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so I've got about 10 slides here just to set the stage for the conversation that we're going to have. And I just wanted to get us all on the same page with what our goal is for the next half hour or so, which is to familiarize you with the grant writing process. And hopefully after the next 30 minutes, you'll be more comfortable with searching for grant programs appropriate to the projects that you're working on. Um, you'll be able to identify and reach out to potential collaborators and think about how to structure your proposal. So we can go to the next slide. And just some, some useful vocabulary as we're thinking through some of the agencies you might be considering or interpreting the calls for proposals that you might be reading. Um, so when we say, when I'm gonna be saying things like basic science, what I mean is a topic that's not directly usable by an end user, so not necessarily stakeholder focused. And that's probably not what our group is gonna be focused on. Applied science is research on a topic that's going to translate into a useful tool for a stakeholder. And those applications might be close in time, so near term, longer in time, midterm, five or 10 years, or long term greater than 10 years. And then translational science is the work of taking that applied research to that end user. And so here in the US at our land grant universities like MSU, extension is one of those key translational science methods. I'm gonna use the letters RFA and RFP several times on these slides. And that is the agency's description of their funding proposal. So those are interchangeable um, phrases. Program solicitation is another uh, phrase that's used. And so these are the instructions, kind of the roadmap to applying for that grant opportunity. And then finally, investigators. So these are the people who are participating in the grant. Principal investigators are usually the person who is writing and leading the grant. And then co-PIs or co-investigators are those that contribute part um, of the project. All right, we can move on to the next slide. So there's lots of different ways you can identify funding opportunities. Working with a program like Feed the Future is one way to identify funding or one entity that develops funding opportunities. In the US, government funding include things like the Department of Defense, and they are gonna fund the, the range of research opportunities, basic, applied, and translational. The National Institutes of Health, NSF, which fund basic work, while NIH funds basic applied and translational work. And then US Department of Agriculture and US AID, which fund primarily applied and translational work. Non-government organizations, so for us in the US, one of the big ones that we focus on is the Gates Foundation, which again can fund the whole range of science, but has recently focused on more applied and translational work. And the most important um, thing to do when you're looking at any of these funding organizations is to decide if your project is in line with the type of work that they fund. One tip that I use when I'm talking to people who are not sure if an agency might fund their work is to look at the acknowledgement sections of presentations and papers in your area of interest or people who are doing work similar to what you're doing in other regions or locations and see where they're generating their funding from. So this is often what I do if I'm moving into a new research area and trying to figure out um, what resources might be available to support that work. We can go to the next slide. 
All right, so let's move on to that RFA. Once you've identified your funding agency, you should be able to find a request for proposals or a request for applications. Again, that's RFP or RFA. And that document is going to have really important information that's critical to your success in applying for that funding. First, when is that proposal due? And you wanna work backwards from that due date. You wanna give yourself as much time as possible to build your project team and craft the proposal. Sometimes that's not feasible, but try as best as you can to start as early as possible. The RFA is going to also tell you the budget requirements, specifically how much money can you ask for, and then how much overhead or indirect costs can you claim. And so the overhead or indirect cost is the cost that your organization may require for managing the funds. And so that's set everywhere from zero. Some entities do not allow indirect costs or overhead costs all the way up to sometimes 50% of the funds. But it's really important to take note of that number early in the process because that comes out of the total budget. And so you don't wanna craft a budget for a project and then realize that your organization has the potential to take 50% of those funds. Next, the program priorities. So what is the goals of this program? What outcomes do they wanna achieve with the resources that they have available to grant? And that's a really important element to pay close attention to, not only because it relates to whether or not your work is a good fit for this program, but it also will provide you with the language that you can use to place your work in context of the program's priorities. And you really want to take advantage of the information that's presented in the RFP and fit your work to the goals that are being stated. Um, and then project types. So what type of work will they fund? Will they fund research? Will they fund the translational work? Will they fund evaluation? What are the elements of the work that they want to see in that project? And again, pay very close attention to this because if this is an evaluation focused grant and you're writing a research focused project, you may not be a good fit for the type of work they want to fund. And then submission details, uh, things like page limit and other materials that are needed, your CV or resume, your current and pending support, so what other grants have you gotten, support letters. If you don't meet the criteria that are put out here, if your proposal is too long, if you are missing an element that they are asking for, the panel will likely not review your proposal. So again, paying attention to these details is really critical to funding, to writing a successful project. And then finally, something that not all folks pay close attention to, but is a really valuable element of the request for proposals, which is who can you contact with questions? Who is your program contact source? And the whole reason these program officers exist is to successfully achieve the goals outlined in the program by allocating these funds. And so they have a vested interest in answering your questions and making sure that the project you're proposing is a good fit for the program and that you're constructing it in a way that has the potential to be successful. And so reach out to them early in the process if you have any questions about, is this the right project? Is this the right agency? That's the individual to reach out to and take advantage of that resource. You can go on to the next slide. And then just as a sense of an RFP that is out there and available, this is an active request for proposals. And I'm going to let David um, answer any specific questions about this. Um, so this is a funding request that's active through the current Feed the Future program. Um, and we can touch on this in the Q&A period. But this is an opportunity available to people who are um, involved in this call. Let me go to the next slide. All right. So just to touch on finding collaborators, um, most grant programs have specific target groups that they are seeking to support, whether that's a geographic area of the world or a type of institution like a university um, or an NGO. 
And so a good example of that is most USDA research grants are restricted to scientists at public land grant universities like MSU. And so scientists who are not at these universities wouldn't have access to these funds unless they're collaborating with someone who is at an institution that is supported. For those of you who are interested in leveraging funds and may not be affiliated with a specific institution that is available to access those resources, um, you might be in the position to seek out collaborators who are at those institutions. And if you're looking for new collaborators, I always encourage folks to you know, first read someone's website. My website is there if you're just curious more about me. Um, review the things that they are publishing on because even if someone states that they're working on a given area in their website, um, they may not be as active as they are in other areas. So what are they currently publishing in? And if you're approaching someone new that you haven't engaged with before as a collaborator, I always re react better when someone brings a concrete idea or plan to me. So what potential programs are you thinking about targeting? What funding resources are available? What would your role be in the project and what funding would you need to achieve that role? And then what's my win-win proposition in this? Is this an area that I'm working in so I should already be interested in this? Is this a part of the world I have experience in? How do we get to a point where both of us are benefiting? Um, and then lastly, when you're working particularly with a new collaborator, I always want to have conversations about things like data management, data sovereignty, and credit and authorship from the resulting products before we enter into an agreement to work on a proposal, because these are easier conversations to have before there's money on the table. Once there's work being done, these things can be pushed too far in the future and can become difficult conversations to have. So figure that out early in the process. Similarly, if there's any regulatory barriers to working together as a collaborative team, you wanna know that ahead of time. So is there, are there travel restrictions? Are there permits that need to be in place in order for this work to be done? Figure that out ahead of time. All right, I think the next slide is uh, yeah so this is where we start moving into the proposal writing process and as i said start writing as early as you can um if you know of a grant that just was awarded that's not too early to start working for the next cycle next year um, the more time you give you almost always the better a product you're going to generate when i'm starting on a new project this is the order i go in when i'm working on a new proposal First, I figure out what I wanna do. So what are my general objectives? And then based on what I wanna do, I look at the budget relative to the amount of funding the agency is going to provide to a project. So can I do what I want to do with the money that they have available? If not, I need to go back to that first step and adjust my objectives. Next, I work out my specific detailed methods and then finally, I work on the, the bigger picture, why am I doing this, and my anticipated impacts. And so it feels a bit counterintuitive. I don't go straight through the order in which you would read a proposal. Usually you start with the introduction, the objectives, the methods, and then your impacts. But conceptually, it's more important to me to make sure that the project I have in mind is a good fit for the program and the resources that they have to allocate. I try to use language that is similar to that in the RFA to articulate my project goals and objectives. And this is because I, I try to select programs that are closely aligned with the work that I want to do. And I want to reflect back to them that the work I'm doing is closely aligned with their priorities. And if that RFA provides evaluation criteria, or expected sections that they want to see in a proposal. Use these as section headers in the proposal to help the people who are going to be reading it find the information that they're using to evaluate the proposal. So if there's often there is a rubric or a framework in RFPs describing how the reviewers will be evaluating them, if that's present, use that 
as section headers or as part of your outline for your proposal to help your reviewers find the information that they need. All right, let's move on to the next slide. And in general, so this, this schematic just illustrates kind of a, the type of information um, that, uh, that I present in a proposal. So I start off broad with my introduction or my rationale and my justification. So what's the big picture element of this problem? I then narrow it down and talking about previous work that relates to my project. And then the most specific part of my proposal are the goals and the objectives. What do I specifically want to do? And what are the methods that I use to accomplish them? I then broaden that out to talk about my anticipated results and impacts. And then finally, beyond the scope of this project, what is the potential broader impacts of this work? And so this is just kind of this hourglass shape is how I construct the type of information that I'm presenting in a proposal. All right, and then I think the next slide, this is really wordy. I am not gonna go through this in, in deep detail, but I wanted you guys to have this slide for future reference because this is the type of information that I include in each section of the proposal. So I'm just gonna give you a really very high level overview of this. Your introduction should include those program priorities and how you're going to address them, who you're gonna be working with, any early data that you have on the project. Your objectives should be focused to the project that you are conducting. You can have a bigger overall goal that your project is associated with, but I wanna see the specific activities that your project is going to be focused on. They should also be achievable in the timeline of the funds that are available. And this is less important for highly applied work, but I still want you to be thinking about what are the hypotheses that drive the work in the back of your mind. So you might not explicitly state your hypothesis in an applied focused proposal or in a translational extension focused proposal, but you should still know that they're there because that's how we do good science, right? Is having hypotheses driving it. And then for your approach and your methods, the type of detail you provide in your methods is going to be depending somewhat on the type of evaluators you're going to be reading your proposal. So if you're sending this off to an expert panel of scientific peers, then you want to use an appropriate level of detail for that group. However, if you're sending this off to a group that includes stakeholders or end users or a diversity of scientists, you want to use more general language and less jargon. Um, you want to use preliminary data to demonstrate that the methods that you're going to be using actually work, especially if they're new and you don't have a resource that you're tying them to. You want to ensure that those methods are appropriate for the amount of money that you have. So you don't want to propose that you're going to conduct a survey of 10,000 people if the resources that you have are only available are only sufficient to interact with 100 people. So you want to have reasonable expectations. And then a timeline of your activities to illustrate that they'll be accomplished in the project um, period. And then finally, your anticipated results. These in, could also be termed outputs or impacts depending on what the program wants to see. And so what are you going to do with the information that you generate? And this can also include next steps if your project is part of a continuum of future projects. All right, and then I think we're wrapping up to the end here, um, just with this last slide discussing the proposal review process. And typically your proposals will be reviewed by a panel. So a group of several people who provide information and and evaluation of that proposal typically in that group of maybe say six to ten people two to three will read your proposal in detail and then they will provide a summary of your proposal to the greater panel who will discuss its merits and typically these a panel will rank a proposal in categories and these categories depend uh, differ by agency but just an example of what these categories would look like would be outstanding, high priority, medium, low priority, or a do not fund. An outstanding proposal would be a proposal that doesn't need any additional changes. It's ready to go and it is likely to be funded. A high priority proposal would be one 
where it's a good fit with the program. It might have some improvements, but it's also likely to be funded. A medium priority proposal would be one that would fit with the program, but might not be quite ready in terms of the methods that are being proposed or the way it's being presented. And so it's potentially could be, it potentially could be funded, but it's unlikely to um, unless there's money left over from outstanding or higher priority proposals. And then finally, a low priority proposal would be one where it, it could be a fit with the program, but it's just not ready yet. And it would be very unlikely that a low priority proposal would be funded. There's usually often a category panels create, which is uh, a do not fund category. And that would be a category where proposals that are not a fit for the program would end up. And this is where you've you know, just misread the RFA and it's not the right fit for what they're trying to do. Um, this information is useful to keep in your back pocket for when you get your evaluations back from a panel and they help you decide if this is a proposal you wanna revise in the future if it wasn't funded and target at that same panel, or if this is a proposal that you wanna repurpose and, and target toward a different program. All right, so that is the end of the slides. I'm gonna go ahead and stop talking and we can address questions from the group. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I did have, a question come through while you were talking, and this is something that I probably should have addressed up front. Um, the question was, is this, a, is this more of a general presentation or is it specific? And so this is a general uh, overview of uh, funding, how to, how to write proposals for pretty much any funding agency. However, um, and I think maybe David can talk more about this, we do have a live funding opportunity. Uh, so this is your opportunity to get more information or ask questions about that specific funding opportunity. Um, and, and it was sort of not the reason that we created this, um, this course, but it is uh, definitely supplementary to that. So uh, I don't know if you wanna say a few words, David. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, we do have uh, a current call uh, request for applications. Um, we also have a request for information. So what we're trying to do is to reduce the barrier of entry. So just to make it easier for e people to learn about these things. So the, the presentation uh, we just had was really excellent in that regard, in, in that um, Dr. Barak was able to show us very effectively um, what was important through the whole process. And, and you can look at this, uh, these instructions that, that, that she provided and you can modify them to your particular application because essentially what she's done has shown you what is the alphabet uh, of, of how the A to Z and it's from that you construct your own narrative and, and pitch. In our case, we just want to open the door very wide. And if you are at all interested in being part of our innovation lab, just send us a, a short, uh, a couple of paragraphs explaining what your idea is. Uh, again, in French, Spanish, uh, Nepali, Swahili, or whatever language you want, send it to us and, and then we'll have a conversation with you. So, so, what we're trying to do is be a, a counterpoint um, to the high barrier of entry that, that Dr. Burek mentioned, because it's just really hard to get grants. And it's really hard for a variety of reasons, mainly because you don't even know where to start. Uh, you don't know all of the different calls. You don't know how to understand them. Uh, and if you do understand them, you, they may not be suitable for you. you. You may be excluded for a variety of reasons. And so uh, people like Dr. Burke and myself have gone through the whole process from being uh, graduate students in PhD programs, then to being postdoctoral researchers and then assistant professors. And we've gone through lots and lots of failure. Um, so, so we, so that's why we're successful. So, successful people are a history of, of of past failures. So, in this case, they've tried very hard and learned what's suitable. Uh, we've had lots of engagements. We've we've written lots of proposals, but that's very hard for for somebody starting out. 
Um, so we want to try to make it a little bit easier for people just to have a beginning conversation. But but the way in which she was able to provide that overview was great because actually you, you don't often get that. Um, I think what she's doing and what we want to do in this in this whole presentation is sort of pull back the curtain and show you that it's hard to get money, but it's not impossible if you know the rules. And, and what Dr. Burke did was show you some of those rules. And I think one other thing I'll add, um, just along those lines of pulling back the curtain and, and sharing information, is that don't be afraid to reach out to people to review your proposal or answer a question on the RFA or the request for applications um, prior to you working on something. That doesn't have to be the program officer. That could also be someone in your collaborative network, someone who's part of this training session. Um, you can reach out to folks and say, hey, can you read a draft of my proposal? Or can you tell me if our work is a good fit for this agency that I might not have targeted before? Or can you let me know when you see a request for proposals that you think would be a good fit for my work? Um, so those are all very um, useful questions to ask and things that you shouldn't be shy to ask of the network that you have around you. Um, I read lots of proposals for folks um, before they go in. I will say starting early is a really good way to get someone to read your proposal because if you can give them a month or so to give you feedback, that's great. If you need feedback sooner than that, that's going to be a harder thing to say yes to. Um, but take advantage of those networks, too, to have folks um, read the type of things that you're putting forward. Great. Calissa, will I go off and show the slide I had? Yep, go ahead. Um, I think you should have the ability to share your screen. Thank you. Okay, so I, I just had a, a single slide to add to the really excellent contact, content um, that we just heard about in, in as a broad overview. And I really wanna uh, approach it from how to write a winning proposal and a, a few general lessons. Um, firstly, write the grant that will be funded. So many of us are extraordinarily excited about the science that we do. And there's a lot of things that we would like to do but a lot of that will not get funded um, because the panel that is, is evaluating your proposal would, would like to see that if you have sufficient preliminary evidence or does it fit within their call. So make sure that you understand what the panel and what the agency is after and that you write something very specific to that. So write the, write the grant that will be funded. Not, not all the things that you would like to do, but, but what is likely to be funded. And um, the second point is, is extraordinarily important is that writing is editing. You must get something down on a page. Uh, you must understand how many pages are necessary. Um, you must look at the instructions uh, as Dr. Burick talked about, but once you do that, then you come back and you edit and you edit and you edit all the time. So writing is editing. A lot of people who don't have experience oftentimes look at this blank screen on their Google Doc or Word documents and they just don't know where to start. But, but set time aside every day, ideally in the morning before you have any distractions, uh, certainly before you go on to the, the dopamine hit that is social media, um, or email, just start off and, and start writing. One of the things I advise people to do is that before they go to bed, open up your Google Doc or Word document, turn off all the internet, and then the next morning, just open your computer and the page is there and start writing. Set yourself some time, let's say 90 minutes, uh, two hours, and, and don't do anything else. And if you're looking at the screen and you don't know what's going to happen, just stay there. Just keep on writing. It, it's it's a it's a a task that requires continual practice. So turn up every day and write. Um, the other point to understand about grant writing is that you're trying to get money out of people's pockets. Um, now, generally, the money comes from the taxpayer, like in the case of USAID, 
or it comes from rich people uh, like in the Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, or Schmidt Futures, et cetera. But the people who decide where do you get the money are not the actual US government or, or Bill Gates. It's the people on the panel that you have to get through. And their understanding that the world is full of really great projects they could fund, and you have to get the money for your specific project. And they really consider that money to be their own money. They want to, they want, they, they feel they're very important stewards of the money. And they want to make sure that they're going to give it away to the right person. It's a little bit like when you're making your charity contribution. There's a lot of charities out there. You want to make sure you're giving the money to the charity that you think is going to have the greatest effect. And so that means that you are trying to get money out of people's pockets to do the things that you want. And you have to craft an incredibly important story uh, that, that really moves them and gets them to understand why they should invest in your story rather than something else. Um, that's an important part. As Hannah said, uh, please do speak to the program officer as well as other people. Now, it's easy for us to say, speak to the program officer, but it can be incredibly intimidating. And you may want to just submit your proposal and not speak to somebody, that's normal. But get yourself out of your comfort zone, try to speak to a program officer. If you don't know how to do that, reach out to people like myself and, and ask that question. And you could do a, a practice. Oftentimes when I've spoken to a program officer, I haven't been very effective in communicating and I didn't manage to ask my questions effectively. And I felt the conversation was a disaster. And it probably was a disaster, but I got better over time. And so now I'm more effective in asking the relevant questions. And, and on a conversation, you can pick up many details which are really important. Now, many of you, uh, particularly those of you from Feed the Future countries, many of you might be partners on a grant. Maybe you're applying to the Soybean Innovation Lab and, and they have a call open at the moment, for example, and you're going to be a partner. Now, remember that you're coming from the countries we're serving. So you have something unique to offer. And, and in our seven or eight months now, we've seen this unique element time and time again. The fact is you're exposed to the fields where we're trying to do our research five days a week. So, so make sure you understand what is your unique element. And if you're going to partner uh, on a grant, make sure that that partnership is equitable. Uh, make sure that you're getting uh, a fair share of the grant. Make sure you're getting the right things. There's a long history of European and American uh, universities working in Africa, Southeast Asian countries, Central America, where the local partners felt they were just on the grant for as a token, um, that it wasn't equitable. And, and, and oftentimes uh, the international researcher would go there, collect the data, and the local researcher wouldn't be on the papers, uh, wouldn't have had their capacity increased, et cetera. Now this is changing, thankfully, because we understand the old system is inequitable, but make sure that the partnership is equitable. And again, reach out to people like ourselves and others who've had experience to tell you whether it's a, it's a, it's a clean and fair share of the pie that you're getting. And the other point I mentioned earlier is that success is a history of failure. All the successful people with large grants, money, and research programs, they've gotten here because many, the vast majority of their grants failed. And, and it's true failure that you, you craft your story, you craft your writing, you get the exact uh, data that you want to present as preliminary data. So understand that the quicker you start, the quicker you begin failing. And failure leads to success. Um, the, all the successful people in any domain of life um, are a long history of failures. They just don't tell you this, but it's absolutely true. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. Uh, so we had one question. We have a couple questions actually. Um, the first one is from Winnie. Hello, are there other types of funding provided apart from money? And I had asked for some uh, clarification or some examples and um, I, didn't, I didn't get any back, so we'll have to be creative. 
maybe scholarships or, or something like that. Um, I, what are you, your thoughts? Uh, Winnie, are you still on? Would you like to elaborate on that? If you can hear me. So while Winnie is either composing a reply or um, or listening in, the while most of what we're talking about is financial, um, some of those finances are restricted to specific things. So scholarships would be an example where you wouldn't get money that you could spend on salaries or um, or supplies, but it would be resources that would allow someone to come to an institution and receive training. That's one possible mechanism. Another type of program uh, will restrict the type of funding that they deliver um, or that they provide to things like equipment. So things that are very expensive and require a lot of resources to invest in. Um, there might be equipment-based grants. Um, so there might, it typically what we're talking about is, is monetary funding, but it might be monetary funding that is restricted to specific types of expenses or types of activities. In general, what you get beyond the money is uh, lots of soft skill training, uh, which is really important. Um, so Winnie is going to um, come to Penn State uh, to do her PhD. In the, in the spring and, and across the four years, then she's going to be exposed to lots of other skills uh, besides the money that's just going to be invested in her. Sometimes um, organizations will give you uh, resources. For example, if you apply to a grant to Google or Microsoft, they oftentimes give you cloud computing. Uh, that's an important component. Uh, some of the neon sites at NSF, I think give you access to uh, field sites, CJR, if they had any uh, grants, they might give you access to some of the researchers. We had some grants from them in the past. So, so these are the kind of additional things that one can get. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So um, this session is supposed to go till 825, so three minutes, but we do have a 10 minute break after this. So we have several questions. And if you guys are okay with it, we can take those questions and sort of shorten our break or, or maybe we'll have to skip it. Um, so the second question we've got is, does the funding target all types of proposals presented or is it specific to, let's say, agriculture or health? And I believe this is talking about the funding opportunity from the lab, David. The, the lab funding is specific to current and emerging threats to crops. So uh, we want to understand uh, what is currently limiting the growth of crops in the target countries we're focused on. Um, we would expand it to um, pasture, which is important for animals. Uh, so um, grasses, which are important to the production of livestock, but it's going to be around current emerging threats to crops. So it's not agriculture broadly. Uh, it's just whatever threatening crop production in your focal country. Okay, great. Um, we had a question, when funded, do you pay it back after the project or during the project? Uh, uh, you, 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 you should be getting funding as a grant and a grant does not require you to pay back the money. Uh, this is a, it's a grant from either the taxpayer or philanthropy. You can also have a grant from industry. Um, when you have a grant, you must follow the agreements of the grant. And if you have satisfied those agreements and you've conducted the research and led to the capacity training, you do not have to pay it back. The only reason you may have to pay it back is because you have not undertaken the research that the agency has asked you to undertake. Um, it's rare. Um, sometimes an agency or a granting body would just stop the funding. So for example, the Gates Foundation, if they gave you money and after three months, they understood you were not doing the research you were contracted to do, they would stop. Um, but, but having to pay back the money uh, doesn't happen unless in the case of fraud, in that case, your university or, or the group that you're part of has to pay back. And we've seen examples of that in the United States where, where somebody has been fraudulent and their university had to pay back 
the Department of Justice or, or Energy or National Science Foundation, et cetera. Yeah, and just to, to echo David's point, um, if you find yourself in a situation where you're not able to achieve the goals as outlined in the grant, that's also a conversation that you can have with the program officer once you realize that that's the case. The COVID pandemic was a really good example of this. Lots of researchers and others were not able to achieve the goals that they laid out in grants in the timeline that they had envisioned and had to have conversations with program officers about either extending the timeline or adjusting the goals so they were still in line with what the program supported but were achievable given the constraints that were now in place due to the pandemic. And so just because something changes, that's not something you need to you know, be cagey about or try to hide or be concerned that the money is going to be taken away. That's a conversation you can have with the program and the funding agency to try to see if you can come to an agreement given changes in circumstances. Um, if they have decided that your work is worth funding, they, are, they will have a vested interest in working with you to try to address whatever issues develop. So that's, that's a good reminder to build those relationships and continue to, to not be afraid to start those conversations. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two hands raised and we have five questions. So um, why don't we try one of the um, raised hands? Okay. Um, Achal Rahman, go ahead. You're muted, I think. It's still showing you're muted. Can you hear us, Achal? Okay, maybe we'll go to the next one. Please yeah, go. okay, um, all right. So uh, Hannah or David, can you say a few words about theory of change on a grant proposal? The most common question uh, someone can get from a donor is that of the theory, or is that the theory of change does not reflect the context of the proposal? Yeah, I think this is an incredibly, um, a difficult framing of, of grant proposals and, and calls for uh, applications because it's not precisely defined. Um, we're, we're, we're generally scientists and, uh, and we want to do conduct scientific research, both basic and applied, and the theory of change is not precisely defined in applications. And therefore, when you submit your application and it gets to the panel, it gives them easy ammunition to reject your proposal. Um, they don't have to be specific in why, they just say it doesn't uh, fit the theory of change. In general terms, uh, theory of change comes from, from this book from the 50s, 60s and Division of Innovations, but a, a lot of research that if you were to do X, then, then Y will follow. Um, but we know from research and agricultural development that the gap between doing X and having Y is a long period of time. So it's very difficult to articulate what that theory of change is. Um, all I would say is, is really reflecting what Hannah said, which is that reach out to the program officer and the community so that you are reflecting back in your proposal what they're, what they're asking for. But it's a very difficult thing. And, and oftentimes it, it's easy ammunition to shoot down your proposal. Anna, Hannah, would you like to add? Um, so what I would add to that are, are two things. First being, um, I think, in that context, if that is criticism that you've received or that you or that collaborators have received on proposals, I would be sure to clearly articulate the horizon at which your project is working along. So in other words, if this is a project that is designed to elicit, elicit short-term change in knowledge, then define that in the project. If this is a project that is a five to 10 year horizon to change behavior, then define that in the project. 
if this is instead a project that has a greater than 10 year horizon where you want to affect actual outcomes that that change in behavior elicits, then, then be able to articulate that. And so that's how I think about, um, about change relative to the work that I'm doing. Am I building short-term knowledge? Am I affecting midterm behavior? Or am I focused on long-term outcomes? And to, to piggyback on another question that showed up in the Q&A about, is this just a research-related type of framework for writing proposals, or does this include evaluation or other elements? Um, yes, good research entails good evaluation in most cases, right? And the type of evaluation you're doing is going to be somewhat related or actually closely related to the horizon on which you're working. And so my short-term impacts are often able to be evaluated through the collection of data and analysis um, of my actual experiments. My midterm impacts may require surveys or community assessments at some point in the future. And then my long-term impacts, those might involve measuring things like environmental quality or changes in diet over time. So those are bigger picture long-term elements. And so your evaluations should be appropriate for the type of impacts that you're proposing your project will generate. Okay, thank you. Um, let's try another raised hand. So this time is Cynthia. Go ahead, Cynthia. Um, looks like you're muted as well. Can you unmute yourself or do we have to do that somehow? They should be able to unmute since you've given them the opportunity to do so. It's just a matter of if they do or not. Okay, so um, Cynthia Yator, you're, um, you're live. So unmute yourself and ask your question. Looks like you're still muted. Okay, uh, it looks like we're having a problem with people being able to raise their hands and speak. So um, if you do ha have a question, just please type it in the chat or the Q&A because it looks like we're having trouble with that. Um, okay, so let me just go to the next question in the Q&A. Um, how do you make a hypothesis-driven project an equitable one, is a pilot mandatory to win? Um, so I think that's two different questions. Um, so, so a pilot is not mandatory, it depends on the, the, the area of research, but, but certainly having preliminary data is, is, is very important and can be very convincing to the granting agency. So in the context of a large proposal to something like the National Science Foundation, it would be, um, unless it was a rapid response, it would be rather impossible to have it without extensive preliminary data. But it, it generally applies to many different areas. The, the, having a pilot or preliminary data would really help you. Um, the issue about equity, in this context, what we mean is, is whether the partners in Feed the Future countries are there for a meaningful collaboration and meaningful capacity building, or they're just there to take a box. And historically, a lot of partners in these uh, lower income countries were on the proposals because they were taking a box. So when you speak in that context of equity, you want to make sure that um, the research proposal is constructed and the research budget is constructed in a way that engages you and, and, and essentially follow the money. Uh, if the money is $100,000 and five or $10,000 is going to the local partner, then it's not equitable. Um, you, you have to just simply understand, well, what are you funding? Um, are, are you going to have a research visit? Are you going to train people locally, et cetera, et cetera. That's a really important way to do that. The other part of equity <clears throat> revolves around publication. So it's very difficult to speak about publications before they happen, but it's important that you can upfront establish that 
The local partners will be on the publications and ideally leading those publications if that's appropriate. Um, so those are two questions, equity and pilots, and I hope we've addressed them. Okay, thank you very much. We have a ton of um, questions left. Unfortunately, our time for this particular session is over. So um, I'm not sure how we wanna address the lingering questions, but there will be an opportunity to um, have further interaction. So do we wanna, we'll, we'll record the questions, we have them uh, and maybe we can um, send our answers later somehow. Uh, what do you guys think? I think that's great. So I've answered a couple of them in the uh, Q and A with text. Um, so I'm, I'll stick around and I can answer a few more um, in the Q and A with some additional text, and you can capture that. I think in the recording you'll get a transcript of the Q and A, so you can share the responses out as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, thank you, David and Hannah, so much. And um, it is time for us to move to our next session, session three.